Hey, we are talking today about functional neurologic disorders and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or hypermobility spectrum disorders. And what is the link? I'm really excited about this topic. And if we haven't met, my name is Julie Hirschberg. I'm a neurologic physical therapist. I'm the owner and founder of Reactive Therapy and Wellness in the Los Angeles area. And it is EDS Awareness Month. And I've been diving back into a lot of the literature in this area because it is so fascinating. And particularly, really understanding the link between EDS and other disorders. And my fascination for this comes from seeing it clinically. So um, as the as one of the therapists at, at Reactive, I, I see people, but I also do a lot of the screening for our program. So I meet people from all over the country and um, screen them to see if they're a good fit for our programs, either in EDS or in FND. But typically I see people with FND. And one of the things that I see comorbid with FND is a hypermobility disorder. Sometimes it's EDS, sometimes it's not, but this is a very common condition that we see alongside FND. I want to say very loudly, it is not a functional neurologic disorder. So a hypermobility disorder is not a functional neurologic disorder, but we see them at the same time. And in all honesty, when I started working with folks with FND um, about 12 years ago, uh, I didn't screen or really recognize hypermobility disorders within this group. And I think I missed some things. So I'm just gonna tell you that. I missed some things 12 years ago. I mean, you know better, you do better. And now I wanna shout it from the mountaintops because I don't want folks who are diagnosed with FND to not get screened for hypermobility disorders. And we might miss a really big part of intervention to help improve their um, their uh, pain levels, their ability to, to use their body in uh, mobility and in life in a productive way, um, but also to give them supports for joint control and for proprioception. So I wanna talk about a couple of articles, uh, at least briefly. These came out just in the last couple of years. And when I saw them, I was like, oh, Oh, it's not just me. It's not just us at Reactive where we're seeing this, um, that, that people with FND often also have a hypermobility syndrome, sometimes not diagnosed, right? So we're doing screening and then we're referring people for diagnosis. Um, it's not just us. It's not just us seeing this. In fact, one of the papers that I want to talk about, um, it's called, uh, it was published in 2022. It's called Hypermobile Spectrum Disorders, uh, Disorders, Symptoms in Patients with Functional Neurologic Disorders and Autism, a preliminary study. This particular paper, I actually met the authors at the FND Society meeting where they presented a poster with some of this data. So this is small amounts of data. Um, I'll give you some of the statistics from it. So not a huge study, it's preliminary. But when I met them, I was like, oh my gosh, we're seeing this. You must be seeing this. That's why you studied it. And yes, exactly. Um, I do wanna tell you this group is out of, I hope I get this right, uh, they're out of Italy. Uh, actually, so I'm sure they're going to be at the FND Society meeting that is coming up uh, in June. So uh, this was published in Frontiers in Psych Psychiatry in 2022. And as usual, by the way, if you want these articles, this is a free full text. I'll put it in our newsletter this week. If you're a clinician, sign up at reactiveeducation.com. If you're a patient, sign up at reactivept.com. I'll send out these articles. So what this group did is they looked at, uh, let me give you the numbers. They had 27 people with FND. They had 27 people with autism and they had 26 uh, neurotypical, no symptoms um, folks. So pretty even groups that they could compare. And then they looked for 
prevalence of hypermobility uh, symptoms. And they found this, get this, this was a lot. They found that 55% of patients with FND had hypermobility sim sim symptoms. 44% of patients with autism had hypermobility symptoms. Um, and actually 30% of the neurotypical, uh, no symptom um, folks actually had hypermobility sim sim symptoms. Wow, I'm struggling with the words today. Symptoms as well. So there's a lot just in those three statistics. One is in a small group of people with FND, over half had hypermobility symptoms. In a small group of people with autism, 44%, uh, so almost half, had hypermobility. That's a known correlation, by the way. That's not just this study that's been looked at in other places. Folks with autism are more likely to have hypermobility uh, syndromes. Um, but also 30% of the, the healthy controls also had hypermobility symptoms. The lesson there is this is not an uncommon issue. Hypermobility is common. And that is part of EDS Awareness Month is that this, uh, this, this thing that people thought was very rare is not actually rare. We just weren't recognizing it. And I'm thankful it's becoming more, uh, more recognized in the medical field, but still not enough. People aren't screening it. And I tell you this because we see hundreds of people with FND that clearly should be diagnosed with hypermobility syndrome and they're not, nobody's even talking to them about it until they see us and we screen them. So this is common. It is common. If we're, if this small study found 50% of people. Now, in the other study, so um, let me pull that one up. I've got all the studies up here on my computer. This study, and I've talked about both of these studies before in other ways too, by the way. Um, I'll put it in this study in our newsletter as well. This one was just from this year, 2024. It's called Functional Neurological Signs in Hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Hypermobile Spectrum Disorders with Suspected Neuropathic pain. So what they did here is they had a group of people with hypermobile EDS or hypermobile spectrum disorder. They had 24 of them. And then they did a retrospective chart analysis to see how many of these folks actually also had functional neurologic symptoms. And 22 of the 24 patients, uh, by the way, they, they uh, compared them to healthy controls. 92% of the patients had at least one motor or sensory functional neurologic symptom. That's a very high rate. So these were not people diagnosed with a functional neurologic disorder, but in a retrospective chart review, looking at the symptom presentation, they found that 92% of these folks with uh, hypermobility spectrum disorder or hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome actually had some functional symptoms. Um, so that was at least one. 20% um, had only one symptom. 58% uh, had between two and four symptoms and 12% had five or more functional symptoms. So again, this is confirming what we see as well, but that we should, in, in this case, they looked at not a population of people with FND, they looked at a population of people with hypermobility uh, spectrum disorders and found that that high percentage of them also had functional neurologic symptoms. So in the case of a person with a hypermobility syndrome, we should also be screening for a functional neurologic disorder. Now, that is interesting, right? It confirms what I see clinically, what many other people see clinically is that these two things can coexist. 
I, of course, being kind of the annoying toddler that I am and so curious, I'm always asking why. And I know many of you are too. You're just curious. Why is this happening? What's happening in the brain? What's happening in the body? Why could this be? And we don't fully know. Okay, so I'm going to tell you right now, we don't fully know why. But there are some interesting hypotheses here and it kind of makes sense. So I was talking to another person um, with FND and a hypermobility disorder. Um, she had functional seizures just last night and we were talking about this and I said, look, it makes sense. If you have a hypermobility spectrum disorder or hypermobile EDS, you are not always getting the most accurate feedback from your body in terms of joint proprioception. So joint proprioception is the ability to feel where your joint is in space. So like a, a simple example would be like, I feel my arm is extended, I feel it bent, I feel it somewhere in the middle and so on. And, and that's actually a, one of the ways that we test it. Um, if you're not a clinician, I'm, I know clinicians, you know what I'm talking about, but if you're not a clinician, that's that's what that means. So, it is known and very well understood that if, if a person has uh, EDS or a hypermobile spectrum disorder, that they may have impaired joint proprioception because their joints are moving excessively. And this lack of proprioception, uh, well, let me put it this way. It's not, not the lack of proprioception. Proprioception, proprioceptive information from the joints, um, from muscle stretch, there's several different receptors that provide this information. That goes to the brain. The brain interprets where your body is in space. And I hear this from folks um, with uh, hypermobility disorders like, um, maybe feel a little wonky in their body, maybe feel a little disconnected, maybe feel a little floaty because they're not getting that accurate information from their joints about where they are in space. And this is especially true in the neck. So the neck um, has a high amount of joint proprioceptors that give information to the brain about where your head is in space. And if that is impaired, it can especially make you quite dizzy um, because your brain is not getting accurate information about where your head is in space. And your, your neck, your eyes, your inner ears are all coordinating to give you that sense of where, where you are and how your head is turning and things like that. So um, all of those are components that can occur. They don't occur to the same degree with every person with hypermobility. It's not that every person has the same exact experience of, of an impaired proprioception, but it's common. So what happens when the brain is not getting accurate information about the body. The brain works in a predictive way. So the brain predicts the movement to occur, um, to be efficient. I've talked about this before. There's some really great uh, images that uh, that go with this to discuss the, the predictive brain. Um, if you haven't seen it before, uh, send me a message and I'll send you a prior video where we talk about the predictive brain. So the brain and the nervous system is set up to predict our movements and our motion because this is uh, really efficient. The brain gets good at this by getting feedback from the body, feedback from proprioception, also feedback from internal body sensations or interoception, which is also known to be um impaired in folks with hypermobility syndromes as well because all that connective tissue is inside too. So our brain gets that feedback. It updates the program for movement based on the sensory feedback. One of the mechanisms of FND is that is potential is that the um, the sensory feedback is inaccurate and it's giving 
inappropriate feedback to the brain. And in F and D, we do understand that, that it, it appears that there is an over-reliance on the feed forward mechanisms, the predictions. And that makes sense actually in a person with hypermobility who is not getting good feedback from the body, they're gonna have an over-reliance on the prediction because the feedback is inaccurate. And so that might be one of the reasons why a person with hypermobility syndrome could develop a functional neurologic disorder because they're not getting great feedback from their body. And um, this is a known uh, component of a functional neurologic disorder. This also happens not just in a hypermobility disorder, but in a neuropathy or another injury. I always point to this book. I was telling somebody about this just yesterday. Um, Oliver Sacks, A Leg to Stand On, prominent neurologist, wrote this book after a leg injury. He essentially developed a functional neurologic disorder after a leg injury because of a, a sensory loss or change. That's what we're talking about occurring in, uh, in well, let me, let me, let me uh, reframe that. We're talking about a similar thing in hypermobility disorders. I'm not saying a person with a hypermobility disorder had a leg injury like Oliver Sacks, so I want to be clear on that. But the same kind of thing where that sensory information and the feedback to the brain is inaccurate. This doesn't mean that everybody with hypermobility has FND. That's not what the research shows. It doesn't mean that hypermobility is FND, not at all. It means that they can exist together. And what I would speculate is it kind of makes sense that they might because of the sensory component of FND. And this is where I think it is so important for us as clinicians to screen for hypermobility disorders and treat. And that includes things like helping improve somebody's proprioception through many different ways. It can be through compression. It can be through bracing. It can be through strengthening and activities. There's loads of ways to do this. And if we're working with somebody with FND and totally unrecognizing that they have this physical issue and we're not addressing it, we're missing a gigantic piece of the puzzle. We need to address that. That person might need bracing so they keep dislo they stop dislocating their shoulders or their fingers or their hip or their knee or their ankle or any of the pieces, right? Um, another thing that I think about um, that we see so frequently together is pain. And pain, chronic pain, joint pain, so common in a hypermobility disorder as well um, be, be, because of the biomechanics of it. And again, we need to support that person's body and not ignore that component of their picture. So, what, what's the take home here? From these two studies, we found that hypermobility is highly prevalent in a group of folks with FND. And in the other study, they found that functional symptoms were highly prevalent in a group of people with hypermobile spectrum disorders or EDS. Together, now these are small studies, right? But together, the, the underlying pieces, we need to screen. We need to screen for functional neurologic disorders and we need to screen for hypermobility disorders in our folks with FND. And we need to treat it. One is not the other, but they can coexist. And, and maybe quite possibly the lack of proprioception um, or impaired proprioception or um, or inaccurate sensory feedback from the body that we see with hypermobility might actually be influencing um, and, and, and contributing to the functional symptoms. 
I find this so incredibly fascinating. Um, and I want to hear from you. Tell me what you think. Do you see this? Uh, what are your thoughts about kind of underlying issues here and these connections? I want to hear from you. So please comment, please share, please ask questions. The two studies, which were from 2022 and 2024, I'll put in our newsletter. Um, if you comment after I post this video, if you comment newsletter, I'll send you the links. But if you're a clinician, you can sign up for a newsletter at reactiveeducation.com. If you are a patient, or a family member, sign up at reactivept.com. I'll send all of this out in our newsletter this week, including the links to these articles. This is so interesting. It's such interesting stuff. So thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you. I appreciate your curiosity. I appreciate that you, like me, want to keep learning more about this and um, we'll keep learning together. Um, and I'll just read this comment too. I have FND and currently in the process of being evaluated for EDS. This all makes a ton of sense. And I just want to say, yay, that you're being evaluated for, for EDS. And, you know, most of the time when I meet somebody, they have had symptoms of a hypermobility disorder since they were a little kid and completely undiagnosed. So they had stretchy skin, they had lots of injuries, um, they um, found themselves bruised for no reason, um, they had gut motility issues, they had some, um, maybe some dysautonomia that comes along with EDS. They've had these things for their whole life. And understanding their reason and being diagnosed is so, so helpful. Um, and either way, so this person said, I have FND and currently in the process of being evaluated. Here's the really good news too, is when you get connected to a physical therapist, occupational therapist, psychologist, um, speech therapist, a yoga therapist, a anybody that understands those two, they are going to be able to give you great resources, great support um, to address all of the things together, um, all of the things together so that you can really live your life fully. So I'm glad you're getting the help that you need. I think it's going to make a really big difference in your life too. So thanks for that comment. And again, thank you all for being here tonight and um Let's keep asking questions and getting curious about this together. Thanks so much and have a good night.